Hi there, this is Dr. John Bergsma from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology, and welcome to The Scripture and the Internet, that show where we take your questions from the internet about the Bible. Megan White writes in and says, when a pregnant mother receives the Eucharist, does her baby receive too? If so, how does this work since the baby has yet to be baptized and is still afflicted by original sin? Megan, great question. Uh, but the baby does not receive the Eucharist. Uh, the Eucharistic presence of our Lord only remains in the mother while the bread is still bread. But within about 10 or 15 minutes, that bread is broken down in the, st in the stomach and the Eucharistic presence of Jesus is no longer there. So it's not like it gets into the molecules and goes through the umbilical cord and uh, all of that. However, that baby definitely benefits from his or her mother being in love with Jesus. Just check out uh, 2 Timothy 1.5 and 1 Corinthians 7.14, and you'll see what I mean. Next, Andrew Anderson asks a fantastic question, and this is one that I had myself before I became Catholic. How can every Mass be a sacrifice when Hebrews talks about only having one sacrifice? Andrew, great question. In my old Bible, uh, my old Protestant translation that I used before I became Catholic, I actually wrote next to that passage in uh, the book of Hebrews, I wrote in the margin and said, this is why we don't have the Catholic Mass. Yeah, ironic. So what is going on, Andrew? The issue is this, Andrew. The Mass is not a different sacrifice than Calvary. It is one sacrifice. The priest is the same, the victim is the same. What happens at the Eucharist is that we move through time and space to the foot of Calvary, and what took place at Calvary is made present. It kind of invades the present, and the concept is Christ's one sacrifice for all time cannot be contained by space and time. It permeates all place. It permeates all time. And so in any place and time, we can take advantage of the presence of Christ's sacrifice. The Mass is the way that our Lord taught us to make himself and his sacrifice present in any time and any space that it is necessary. Mark Grabowski writes in and says, why will we need bodies in heaven? We have bodies in the material world to interact with the material world. We have to clarify something here. Um, we have bodies for the world to come, okay? And at the final judgment, we are going to be given a new heavens and a new earth. That's what the Bible describes. And we are inherently physical creatures. We are body-soul unities, and we were meant to have a body, and God will restore our bodies to us. So it is a dogma of the faith that we believe in the resurrection of the body, not just the resurrection of the dead to some kind of immaterial state, but the resurrection of the body. And Mark, we base this off of Christ's own resurrection, where he was not an ethereal spirit, uh, but he was raised from the dead, was able to eat, able to talk, etc., and interact with the material world. So we don't know exactly how it's all going to be. St. Paul calls it a great mystery that will be transformed in the twinkling of an eye. But we base some of our conceptions off of what Jesus' resurrected body was like. Uh, he was able to move through doors to come into a locked upper room, but then he also ate. So we know that his body had properties that go beyond what our bodies have now, but it is still a material body. And we're confused a little bit by heaven, which is an intermediate state where our body is not resurrected yet, but that's not our final state. Um, our final state is going to be in uh, as a, uh, the new heavens and the new earth, which God is going to make for us. And it's going to be a material reality that's mysterious from our present perspective. All right, so we have a question here from Anonymous who has... Actually, multiple questions related to Satan. First of all, can you explain why God allows Satan on earth? God allows Satan on earth to present us the possibility of doing evil. And that is necessary in order for us to have free will. God wants persons who freely love him. And love cannot be compelled. Love has to be a free choice. And for there to be a free choice, 
we must have freedom to choose good and freedom to choose evil. And Satan is allowed by God to present us the possibility of doing evil in order that we can freely choose God out of love and not just by being compelled. There's other reasons too, but I'm going to suggest some resources uh, to read on this later. Again, Anonymous asks, I thought Michael cast the devil into hell. I don't get it. Is earth hell? No, uh, Anonymous, earth is not hell. Hell is the absolute maximum of the non-presence of God that you can get. And as bad as things get here on earth, it's not the maximal non-presence of God. Not by a long shot. That's going to be really bad. But uh, again, uh, Anonymous asks, I thought Michael cast the devil into hell. That's not what the scriptures say, Anonymous. Uh, the scriptures actually say in Revelation 12, 9, that St. Michael cast the devil down to the earth along with his fallen angels, not to hell. And how did Satan get into the Garden of Eden? Great question, Anonymous. Satan got into the Garden of Eden because Adam failed in his priestly role to guard the garden. Genesis 2.15 says that Adam was placed in the garden to work it and to guard it. Those are Hebrew priestly terms. Priests worked and guarded the sanctuary of God, as we see in the book of Numbers. And so a serpent is an evil creature, it's an unclean creature, should never have been allowed into God's sanctuary, which was the garden. So from Genesis 3.1, where we see that there's a serpent in the garden tempting Eve, that already tells us that Adam failed in the duty that God gave him to guard the garden and keep out anything unclean. Adam should have fought against that serpent that was either a represent, representation or an embodiment of uh, the evil one of Satan. Adam should have contended with that serpent and risked his life to keep it out and keep it away from his bride. But he didn't. And so here we are. But Christ, the new Adam, goes to death in order to protect his bride, the church, and through his death, in fact, conquers the evil one. Thanks be to God. And the evil one is conquered every time we celebrate a sacrament. Anonymous, great questions about Satan. There's so much more that we could say about him. I'm going to recommend some books by Father Dwight Longenecker and Father Cliff Ermatinger that are going to be in the comments section below. Thank you all of you for sending in your questions, and thank you for watching this episode of The Scripture and the Internet. If you got further questions about the Bible, please put them in the comments below. Also, like and subscribe uh, to these uh, video sessions. We'd really appreciate if you do that. And until next time, may God keep you happy and holy.